We're going to play this whole thing in its entirety so you can capture the essence of this news. Sorry, let me put the camera on myself for a second. News <laughs> package that MSNBC has put together in an effort to uh, dismiss the NSA prism leak story regarding um, Edward Snowden. Here we go. Okay, let me get this straight. The NSA is a big, scary surveillance monster that knows everything we do. But it didn't know that one of its own contractors was working with Glenn Greenwald on a massive leak about the NSA. Tonight, I'll ask Glenn Greenwald if his own experience is actually evidence that the NSA isn't really so scary. So... This is his this is his big opening, right? <laughs> Mr. Prosecuting Attorney. And right? and I love how he puts in this supposition that they know everything. Yeah. That's his that's his little straw man that they know everything. Right. right? So so he does kind of a long lead in here with a series of media clips and then he'll bring Greenwald in and answer that question. So we'll let it play for a couple minutes. <laughs> I'm no different from anybody else. I'm just another guy. Opposition to the government's sweeping surveillance program now has a public face. 29-year-old Edward Snowden revealed himself. 29-year-old Edward Snowden. He leaked information about the government's surveillance program. He's a 29-year-old former technical assistant for the CIA. Then he goes over to work for this contractor for the NSA. He landed this job. Oh, and just so you understand like the tone of this show, Larry, Larry O'Donnell gets the last word. Always. On everything, so he shows. Here's what everybody else has had to say, which is why he has these montages of media clips. Then I'll let that, you know that also pepper yeah. you with information that he has selected about this guy, <laughs> 29 year old janitor. You know, yeah. here's what everybody who doesn't know about this has had to say already. Yeah over two hundred thousand dollars are his motives pure i have no idea he says he did it because the public needs to know what's going on big breaking news today i certainly wasn't uh, shocked by it big breaking news about something we've known for like seven years is this guy a criminal or is he a whistleblower he's not a whistleblower do you think he has credibility as a whistleblower you don't break the law steal documents and then make a run for the border i can tell you this these programs are within the law aren't all the programs that have been revealed Legal. The damage these revelations incur are huge. This is U.S. policy. You may disagree with it. I'm no different from anybody else. I'm just another guy. The law was broken by one person, who was Mr. Snowden. Snowden's treatment may rest on public perception. Glenn Greenwald continues to break news about the National Security Agency, and he will join me in a moment. But first, the shocker of the weekend was the secret leaker in the NSA story broke the mold for leakers and decided to go public. My name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. Edward Snowden spent his first years in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and then his family moved to Maryland when he was nine years old. He has an unusual background for someone in a position of trust in the intelligence community. He was a high school dropout, but he did a... Hold on to that one, too, okay, because that's, that's, that's coming back. ...obtain a GED. He spent less than a year in the Army Reserve. Snowden says he was discharged after breaking his legs in a training accident. He first worked for the NSA as a security guard. He then got an information technology job with the CIA. According to The Guardian, Snowden worked at the NSA for the last four years as an employee of various outside contractors, including Dell and Booz Allen Hamilton, where he last made about $200,000 a year. This is the way Wait a minute. Edward Snowden... Can we just go back? Now, this is, this is a trick that the media often uses, and, and I recommend that if you haven't seen it, people check out this School Sucks video, Media Manipulation on Gun Control, where we talk about some of the other aspects to a television presentation that are often absorbed but not always recognized. When the gun control debate was happening, uh, Piers Morgan and his production team, as these debates heated up, the on-screen graphic would say something like, 20 killed in Newtown. And then they would show footage that they had as they're having the debate about gun control of the police and rescue workers arriving on the scene at the elementary school. 
So without that's that's an incredibly powerful, uh, but at the same time subtle uh, juxtaposition of like here's a debate, right? Like, should we really be having a debate when you're absorbing these visuals at that's the same time? Very distracting, giving you alternate information. So they yeah. take advantage of that. I mean, uh, let's see. Uh, here they they put up a a final bio on the screen of Edward Snowden. Number one, did not finish high school. <laughs> Number two, discharged from army. Uh, three, worked as a security guard for NSA, uh, hired by CIA, earned two hundred thousand dollars with Booz Allen Hamilton. Maybe just a yeah, I don't, just I don't, to squeak that. And what are his motives? We already had that in the little montage that we put together. Why would he be doing this? Mm. So here we go. Four years as an employee of various outside contractors, including Dell and Booz Allen Hamilton, where he last made about $200,000 a year. This is the way Edward Snowden described why he decided to leak NSA material. When you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, you're exposed to a lot more information on a broader scale than the average employee. And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Uh, when you see everything, you see them on a more frequent basis, and you recognize that some of these things are actually abuses. And when you talk to people about them, uh, in a place like this where this is the, the normal state of business, people tend not to take them very seriously and you know, move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up, and you feel compelled to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you're ignored, the more you're told it's not a problem. Until eventually you realize that uh, these things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who is simply hired by the government. Now, at this point, Gardner, he has tried to lay out the background knowledge that he feels you should have before proceeding with this story. Right. Do you think that he's done uh, an adequate job, a poor job? Because, I mean, he has brought a lot of stuff together here, but I he know has, you've been looking into this. He's done an absolutely beautiful job if he wants to focus on the man mm -hmm. rather than what the man has reported. If he wants to raise questions about the man's activities... And whether or not those comport to being a good citizen un within the context of the nation state. Yeah. Especially the nation state that this guy, Lawrence O'Donnell, uh, really loves to kiss the ass of. Right now. Exactly. Yeah. He loves it. This guy is the biggest rump swab I've seen in a long time. <laughs> yeah. And he has done nothing to actually explain what's really at stake. Yeah. Has done nothing to say... Here are the claims this guy made. Here is what seems to be the reality. And nothing to offer. What, what I think would be nice was, are you worried about this? And where do we go from here? Okay. So yeah, I think he's done a great job in setting things up if you want to support the state and, and put this guy in as the focus and the question of the whole thing, to which is it, not the point. To take it to the man. It's the information right? that he released, exactly. And they're, they're, they're addressing the, the guy who released it. Because uh, with the, the kill the, the, the messenger yeah. approach yeah, yeah. or the character assassination approach, which is something that you're going to get into, you don't have to go through a whole series of complex and very, for, for some people, uh, very compelling ideas and information. Yeah. You only have to destroy one man. Exactly. And he's, he's already posed a bunch of questions, as you pointed out, that freeze frame that you did was really, really spot on because that's exactly what this guy is doing. And I don't think Lawrence O'Donnell goes through that with any sort of strategic methodology. Mm -hmm. I think it's just his nature to do it that way. To say, this guy, I don't like what this guy's done, so I'm going to go after this guy. Right. So he's already, his assumptions are already there. I don't know, I, I just think, I don't think that he's doing it with any sort of, you know, intent. I just think it's his, you know, sort of sad way to stumble into the party already drunk. He's, you know? he's from Southie, you know. Yeah. He's a brawler. <laughs> yeah, he's he, a brawler. <laughs> He threatened to punch Mitt Romney's son. I thought that was hilarious. Yes, yeah. he's a uh, so. But that, but but the setup here at this point. I mean, how how far into the video are we? It's we're like three minutes. We're almost a third of the way into it. A little less than a third of the way into it. And what he's established is: look, I provided all the information that you need to know to have sufficient background knowledge about this subject. On top of which, we will build the debate. 
Right. Which is really on very shaky ground that he is still able to and, control and or the, try to control. Right. And the great thing is, you know, coming from a context of, of having listened to your podcast earlier today, with this massive history of all this stuff and this being the most current wrinkle in this, you know, sad, sorry, ugly face of the state, mm -hmm. is that he's about to bring Glenn Greenwald on. And Glenn Greenwald is completely on top of all of this history. Yes. Glenn Greenwald's knowledge of this is voluminous, you yes. know? And they're, they're two totally different. He's talking to an alien creature. He doesn't get it. It's really, it, it's beautiful. <laughs> I'm a straight man, and I would, I would <laughs> propose to Glenn Greenwald based on, on this presentation. I, I would go gay for Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> he's really, G -G -G. he's so fantastic. All right, so here we go. Here's how Snowden described what the NSA actually does. NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can by any means possible that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now increasingly we see that it's happening domestically and to do that they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. Joining me now from Hong Kong, The Guardian's Glenn Greenwald, who broke this story. Glenn, I be, I've been wondering as the stories developed that given that the NSA, uh, as, as you're portraying it, uh, knows everything, sees everything, how is it in, in that <laughs> environment that you were able to communicate internationally over a period of time with someone working as a contractor for the NSA right under their noses? I mean, isn't, isn't what you've pulled off here, uh, this successful leak, evidence that the NSA really doesn't know everything that we are suggesting it knows. Gotcha, Glenn. <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> look at the look on his face. Oh, that's going to be what a smug, smug mug. I'm going to screenshot this video and put pictures in the show <laughs> notes because that is like you look up smug in the dictionary. All right. So number one, this is this is this is the opening approach. Um, Laurie, Lawrence O'Donnell's first swing at this. The NSA isn't so scary. Um, and he's trying to undermine the relevance of the whole story, as I said earlier. So he's certainly asking a loaded question. He's also committing the fallacy fallacy, yeah. saying that basically the argument can be thrown out because Glenn Greenwald has committed this tragic, just devastating to his case fallacy <laughs> that the NSA uh, knows everything. Um, personal incredulity, right? That's another kind of logical fallacy. Perfectly. Uh, where yeah. he's, well, I couldn't believe this, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I mentioned before the either-or or excluded middle fallacy. And uh, it's kind of a, also like a, some pretty sloppy inductive reasoning. Are you familiar with yes. uh, composition? Yeah. To say if absolutely. You, you set... He's seeing one example. Yes, right. that's absolutely right. So you say, if the NSA didn't know this... They and they, they can't do all the other stuff. Everything. Absolutely. So kind of broadening it to the big picture. So if they don't know this one little thing, right. they can't certainly know all these other things in the bigger picture. And inductive reasoning can be useful sometimes, but not useful for Larry O'Donnell. Right. So let's see if Glenn Greenwald runs away crying. Unfortunately, I, I wish that were true, Lawrence. Unfortunately, it isn't. Um, when he first contacted me um, back in February, the first thing that he insisted that I do was to install extremely sophisticated uh, encryption technology that would allow us to communicate via email and online chat. Um, one of the very few ways that makes it difficult for the NSA to intervene in, in communications. You have to have a very high level of sophistication to be able to do that, to operate it, something I certainly don't have. And it's actually, it actually delays 
delayed for, for quite some time our ability to communicate. So if you go to extreme lengths that the world's greatest programmers and, and cryptologist experts um, have in order to install and, and figure out how to do programming, maybe you can stay a step ahead of the NSA for some time. Um, but anyone who isn't doing that is going to have their communications monitored and, and stored. And that's the only way that he would end up talking to me and did end up talking to me. Okay. Okay. Well, let's try something different. <laughs> All right. So now that that has not been terribly successful, we'll shift to character assassination. We'll take it to the man, Snowden. Uh, I think he'll end up taking it to Greenwald a little bit as well. Yeah. I love the look on his face, too, because I, he's like, I'm so excited by how dumb you are. Yeah. Because you're giving me I'm just gonna give you the yeah. perfect platform to express all this great. stuff. Oh, and can I just mention, as you go sure. into this, um, you know, sometimes I go into these high school classes. We've been communicating this sometimes. And, and um, uh, I'm there on a panel with Democrats and conservative Republicans and stuff like that. Yeah. And invariably... What I find is that almost every one of them, especially on the left-wing status side, says, well, Gardner will tell you this. And then they go, so they set up the straw dog of what I'm going to say. Yeah. And then they, so they set up their own argument with what they imagine I'm going to say. Just what O'Donnell did with, oh, they know everything. This is what you're saying. And he actually said, well, according to your argument, this is what they all know. And this happens all the time to people who are actually trying to address a real point. The other people will misconstrue their point and then try to make an argument that has nothing to do with it. Right, exactly. Yeah. The straw man argument. Yeah. Uh, the NSA's hiring and contracting practices. Clearly, they would not have wanted uh, Snowden working for them if they knew then what they know now about him. And obviously, they're not really screening who gets to work close to this material very closely. Well, I mean, I'm not so sure that's true. If you look at his history, I mean, he's exactly the kind of person that you would want working for you if you're in the intelligence community. The first thing that he did after he got out of, after he did, he actually didn't complete high school, but would have completed high school, was he enlisted in army training to join the special forces to go fight in the Iraq war because he thought that war was so noble and, and that he was quickly disabused of that belief. But he then went to work for the NSA and the CIA after that. He had, you know, devoted himself to serving his country. And it was only over time when he began to realize just how pervasive this surveillance state is, how secretive it is, how without accountability it is, did he start gradually having his eyes opened about what this national security apparatus really does and felt compelled to step forward and do something about it. But that is the key. When you have the sprawling system and there are 20,000 employees at the NSA, but many other tens of thousands working for private contractors collecting enormous amounts of data, it's an unaccountable, uncontrollable system. You're going to give access to huge numbers of people to the most sensitive communications data and other forms of information about people. There's no way to prevent abuse. That's one of the lessons here. And uh, he's uh, kind of low level. I mean, I'm reading what he told Watch you the about what he did there. That Every he will he will continuously use this phrase. <laughs> he's an IT guy, right? Yeah. He's low level, <laughs> and uh, this is uh, what do we call this? The genetic fallacy, yeah. where something is unreliable. It's like saying he couldn't be capable. Oh, this was huge, by the way, during like World War I. Something is bad if it comes from Germany. Uh -huh. So let's call German toast French toast from, from now on. <laughs> uh, but the idea is like, I don't want to buy something that was made in Japan. You ever right. met a Japanese person? Right, like right, that's the right. genetic fallacy, yes, essentially, yes. that something is bad or defective because of where it comes from. So if we can drop this guy down, he can lower Snowden down enough to be able to commit this genetic fallacy that... Uh, he w he wasn't at a place where we could really think that any information that and, he has is worth got... listening to. Unfortunately, this is a joke that only the four of us can enjoy. But in this frame, uh, freeze frame, it appears that Glenn has actually become high off uh, <laughs> Lawrence's stupidity, which is which is interesting. It, no, but this is this is an interesting thing. Like, the have you ever talked to somebody in like real life who made so little sense? that you find yourself, like, spacing out and almost becoming, like, dizzy yeah. from listening to them. Yeah. 
Every one of his titles, Glenn, is simply a technical, he's an IT guy. He says he's a systems engineer, then he was a systems administrator, a senior advisor for uh, solutions, uh, and a telecommunications information systems officer. But at the same time, at the same time as, as giving you a bio that's basically an IT guy, he claimed to have very powerful authority. Let's listen to what authority he claimed he had. I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. Now, Glenn, he does not mean, does he, that he had the legal authority to do that. He is simply saying... This is a clever setup, okay? And again, we see the word legal mm. coming mm. into this. So, so pay close attention, folks. Don't get hypnotized by Larry here. Because I had IT access, I could get into anything I wanted to get into, much like, say, uh, people working in the IRS used to be able to just look at your tax return if they felt like it, even though they were not authorized to do it. The IRS has since controlled that. But he's not saying he in any way could legally, possibly, been given that authority by anyone at the NSA to look at President Obama's email. Precisely, Orange. I mean, but, and you're making the, the important point, and it's the point that he's making. It's the point that he wants everyone to understand, which is that which even though he is a relatively low level, not even an employee of the NSA, a private contractor, he has been given, by, by authority he means, he's authorized to access these databases and this, these technologies, and that there are tens of thousands of people in the NSA who are not accountable, who are authorized to do the same. Everyone should go right now who's listening, go onto Google and email and Google 2008 ABC News NSA abuse, and you will find stories there about low-level NSA analysts who abused these technologies to listen in on the conversations that soldiers were having with their girlfriends, that people they knew were having with one another internationally. It is a system that is begging for abuse because it's all in secrecy. We don't really know what it is that it's doing, but his point is that this apparatus is sucking up every communication, every telephone call, every email, so that at any time, any of these people at these terminals can go in and invade these conversations um, because it doesn't have sufficient oversight, and it's ubiquitous, the surveillance that they're doing. But, Glenn, I don't think we can attack a system's mission because someone working in that system, like Snowden, is willing to actually violate the rules of the system. For- Bingo. Oh, there it is. man. Okay. There you go. So that's why that's what that setup the was all setup. about. And, right. and Larry had to sit there and kind of squirm back and forth in his chair waiting Until for Glenn actually, to finish with yes. the facts part right. so he could get this this in. Right. I don't really care. So what he what he's decided to do... After strike two is just double down on character assassination. Yeah, yeah. Now, where now he's 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 slid out uh, basically the reality and inserted his own reality into yeah. the situation where this guy is a rule breaker. He's the one. It's not the, the problem is him. Right. It's not the system. So you didn't work. Uh, you know the the what what did he do before the low level stuff? I felt like there was. Uh, the the high school dropout, you know, like that, that kind of thing. But then the low level stuff. And now it's like, I think he's, I think he's a a rule breaking criminal. Right. The, he was just this and just that. Right. This is very, very clever. And uh, I I think most of this must go completely unnoticed. With his viewers, mm. right? Because it is kind of subtle. You do have to be looking well, for you, it. Well, uh, you have to give him credit for trying or at least scrambling. Right. For example, my bank. There are, there, there are people working at my bank who can go and look at exactly what's going on in every one of my bank accounts whenever they feel like it because they just saw me on TV and they said, I wonder how much money he has in checking. They can go do that. They're not supposed to. And it doesn't mean that my bank is a bad bank because someone working there violates the rules. Uh, same. Th- there it is again. Mm. Thing with everything else that, that uh, private companies like Gmail, for example, anybody working at, at the uh, email facilities at Google, all these places, they can go look at the people's email who are writing those email if they want to, if they want to break the rules and do that.
Right. Well, first of all, he didn't actually break the rules. He didn't say that he has gone in and invaded other people's communications, that he shouldn't have been looking. He was making the point that he had the ability to do so as a way of warning us. But I think that your question raises the important point. Look, I mean, we have to have a banking system. We have to have email. We don't have to have a government that is collecting all of this information about us. This is a choice that we have as citizens about whether we want the government to be doing this. We have a history in this country that we can look to. Go and look at the church committee report of the mid-1970s, with which I know that you're obviously familiar. And what it found is that when you empower polit- politicians and, and law enforcement officials to gather massive amounts of information about people and don't provide sufficient transparency and oversight to how they're using it, they will abuse it. It's J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI followed Martin Luther King around, read his mail, listened to his conversations, found out about what they thought were adulterous relationships, and tried to use it to discredit him and even encourage him to commit suicide. What he's trying to say is that we should be debating whether we want to have a government that is in the business of collecting huge amounts of extremely invasive information about not terrorists or people suspected of wrongdoing, but all Americans, and think about the potential for abuse that has, the inevitability of abuse that has, and even if you're right, Lawrence, at the end of the day that we decide we do want that, at the very least, we should have way more transparency and checks and accountability on how this is done and what is being done, which is the reason that we decided to write these stories so that we could start a debate and make Americans aware of what this apparatus is actually doing. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, number four is I give up. Yeah, <laughs> it, it really is very simply I give up. But. Glenn, my, my feeling so far is in everything. I, and I've been slow to react to it because I want to take in as much as possible. But so far, I'm not scared. So far, I haven't heard a single thing about what the government has collected on me that isn't also collected by a bunch of private companies. And the fact that the government is collecting it at such a gigantic, massive level means that it's even harder for the government to find me in this giant amount of data that they have. And they have absolutely no incentive to find me. And so I, I, at this stage, feel completely unthreatened by this. I understand every point you're making on principle. I get the principle. And my reaction to it in the practice is I, I, I am at this point unthreatened by it. So I don't care. He doesn't care. I, I, exactly. Right. That's, that's it. Oh, I get what you're saying. Absolutely. So over the course of that interview, I mean, and this is always the way when one person has information and the other person doesn't, you know, they have a, an ideology, you see a retreat. Oh, perfectly. Safe. That's great. Absolutely. So he comes out swinging, right? Strike one, strike two, strike three. I'm taking my ball and going home. Bye-bye, Johnny.